Welcome back. So in this session, we're going to look at approaching context specific service evaluation. To do this, we will consider how to use readily available tools to establish, develop or design a sensory based service within your clinical setting. We're going to discuss the HSE change guide from 2018, look at using a design thinking approach to support your service design and considerations for delivering a new component within your clinical practice setting. The overarching framework that we're going to use as part of this session is that described by the HSE change guide from 2018 when they were discussing their service planning and implementation. So for those of you who aren't familiar with it, the HSE change guide is a step-by-step -step guide to leading and bringing about change. It is based on using the evidence base with an emphasis on practicality and its values are very much about promoting person-centered care and giving public value which we all need to consider as part of our clinical practice. The change guide has three distinct processes define, design and deliver. So if we look into the define, design, deliver process a little more deeply. Define includes looking at the specifics of your service setup and readiness for change and identifying what is it within your service that will both promote and inhibit change and new practices. The design stage looks at designing a bespoke solution to address the organizational barriers and to effectively use the organizational enablers to implement your new skills in your clinical setting. And this includes the creation of an implementation plan. Deliver looks at following through on your implementation plan, re-evaluating of the service requirements where necessary and adjustment of plans to fit with service needs. So why is this important? Change is one of the only constants within healthcare practice today. As busy therapists, finding the time to not only upskill, but to introduce, implement and maintain your skill base can be quite the challenge. By investing your time in identifying service barriers and enablers, designing a bespoke solution that will fit your specific situation and delivering the implementation plan that you have identified, you are more likely to maintain and sustain the changes that you wish to see across your clinical setting. Additionally, the HSE framework very much focuses on looking at an evidence-based method to promote and lead change across your organization. You can find more information by looking up the HSE change guide. They have both the long form and short term versions, but all forms that are discussed in this section of the presentation are freely available for use across any service. OK, so we're going to jump right in and start with the define stage of the HSE framework. Define is important because it helps you to identify factors which will both promote and inhibit change in your local service area. We acknowledge that every service operates differently and this presents quite the challenge when trying to lead change across a number of different organisations or even across a number of different similar but different departments across the local area. While there is not a one-stop solution that will suit everyone, the defined phase is a common one which will allow each practitioner to focus on what will enable and what will inhibit the changes that I am hoping to put into my service. We acknowledge that this may seem like quite a substantial task. And the next few minutes, we're going to spend discussing strategies or perspectives which may be of use to you when defining your service context. So if we look at the diagram and we start at the top and we look at the analysis of the current context, why is this important? Well, if we look at what is currently available within the current context and the impact that that has specifically in relation to implementing a change, then we are more likely to be able to identify obstacles and barriers so that when we get to the design stage, we may be able to find ways around, over or through them. If we move to the right hand side and we look at clinician motivation for change, 
The fact that you're here listening to this session is indicative of your desire to make a change within your clinical practice. While that is incredibly admirable, we do need to bear in mind that initial interest only lasts us so long. We've all seen what can happen um, you know, when barriers or obstacles come our way and the impact that that can have on establishing, leading and maintaining a change within a service. So identifying and looking at your own motivation for why you would like to introduce this within your service is very important for you to look at what skills, attributes and personality characteristics can I use going forward to help me to implement and sustain the changes that are required. Capacity identification. If we think about our caseloads, the first words that most of us use to describe them is busy. This is a typical conversation between two professionals, even of the same discipline. How is your workload? It's busy. Unfortunately, we all tend to work within services which are oversubscribed, which limits our time for realistically promoting and introducing a new idea. So being able to identify your capacity is essential as part of your service planning initiative. It may constrain your initial attempt to introduce it. However, it will make what you're doing more realistic and more sustainable from a resource management perspective. This moves us nicely onto resource identification. What do you have at your disposal that could actively enable you to promote change within your organization? And finally, stakeholder identification and analysis. Who are the stakeholders within my service and how can they assist or what barriers could, could they potentially put in my way to stop me from implementing a change? So one of the main aims in this session is to look at and explore the readily available tools that will assist you in your define, design, deliver process with regards specifically to introducing change and using sensory intervention as part of your clinical practice. So if we think about what we have identified as useful as part of the define process, we can then think about what tools will assist us with getting there. If we begin by considering our analysis of the current context, we can look at a SWOT analysis. So for those of you who are not familiar, this is what a typical SWOT analysis looks like. SWOT, or strengths, weaknesses, opportunities and threats, is a simple but effective evaluation tool when considering an overall service picture. As you were all at different stages of your learning and perhaps at different stages of implementing sensory interventions within your mental health setting, it may be of benefit to look at it based on where you are as you're hearing this lecture. For those of you initially starting off, it may be, how do I introduce a sensory based service within my current clinical practice? For those who have begun to establish a service within their clinical setting, it may be, how do I expand the service? For others, it may be, how do I redesign or promote the sensory based services offered within my setting? It is helpful to re-administer SWOT analysis over time and you may find that previously identified weaknesses have now become an opportunity or even that a threat can now become a strength. Services are not static and the purpose of a SWOT analysis is to capture a picture, one snapshot of where your service is at any point in time. This is why it's such a useful tool because it's something that can be quickly but effectively re-administered if you decide to re-evaluate your service at any point. If we return to our overall defined process, looking at clinician motivation for change can be achieved by using the five whys. I'm sure you'll be glad to hear that the five whys technique is exactly what it sounds like. From an academic perspective, it is an iterative, interrogative technique used to identify the root cause of an issue or a thought. For our purposes as part of the defined phase of the HSE framework, it aims to increase clarity and understanding of a clinician's underlying motivation to affect a change in their practice. 
This is important because later on in the process, when you encounter challenges, barriers, or factors which you hadn't perhaps considered, knowing your motivation for why you want this as part of your clinical practice and why you value it is essential in maintaining motivation, not just at the start, but throughout the process of delivering change within your clinical area. If we then move on to capacity identification. So this specifically relates to you and your practice. It looks at what is your immediate capacity? What barriers are in place that will prevent you or hinder you in your aim to effect change? And what is realistic in terms of change within the current service context? While this will vary from setting to setting as to how you may choose to document this, it is an essential component of the define stage of the process. If we consider the reasoning behind looking at your capacity identification, it's very clear that we're saying change is part of the culture of your service. However, that doesn't mean that radical change or groundbreaking change can necessarily happen overnight. However, if we look at this from a realistic framework, small changes over time can add up. And looking at your capacity to begin to affect small changes with the aim of expanding them over time may actually be the key to successfully implementing these changes in your clinical practice in the longer term. So as with capacity identification, resource identification and the process of this will vary considerably depending on your particular service. There is no one size fits all when it comes to looking at the resources that are available to you. However, we would encourage you to think broadly and to try and encompass as many resources as you can think of so as to gain a full picture of what is at your disposal when trying to effect change. If we think of some of the larger headings, we may include things like our clients. What is it about our client group that will enable us to effect change? Additionally, are there particular clients or subsections within our caseload that may be of use when we're looking at putting together an argument for why this intervention is necessary? Time. What kind of time do you realistically have available? Now, you will have touched on this as part of your capacity identification, but is there perhaps additional time that you could source or allocate or reallocate from another area that may allow you to engage more fully with the process? Referrals. Who do you accept referrals from? What information do you need? And how do you address them? Physical resources. If we look at the built environment, if we look at equipment, if we look at things like petty cash resources, what is it that we have at our disposal, again, that will enable us to deliver this type of intervention as part of our clinical practice? Additionally, if we look at people, So within most practice settings, we could probably all identify motivators or leaders in thought or change thinking, where they would encourage you to affect change and promote you within your clinical practice to do so. It may be that this person is a member of management, or it may be that it's a colleague who feels strongly that your skills are necessary within the wider service context. Who are these people? and how can they potentially be of benefit. This then brings us on to the stakeholder identification and analysis. As you can see, we've looked at using the HSE Change Guide Stakeholder Mapping Analysis, template 6.1.2, to assist with this. So as with capacity identification, resource identification and the process of this will vary considerably depending on your particular service. There is no one size fits all when it comes to looking at the resources that are available to you. However, we would encourage you to think broadly and to try and encompass as many resources as you can think of. So as to gain a full picture of what is at your disposal when trying to effect change. If we think of some of the larger headings, we may include things like our clients. What is it about our client group that will enable us to effect change? Additionally, are there particular clients or subsections within our caseload that may be of use when we're looking at putting together an argument for why this intervention is necessary? Time. 
what kind of time do you realistically have available? Now, you will have touched on this as part of your capacity identification, but is there perhaps additional time that you could source or allocate or reallocate from another area that may allow you to engage more fully with the process? Referrals. Who do you accept referrals from? What information do you need and how do you address them? Physical resources. If we look at the built environment, if we look at equipment, if we look at things like petty cash resources, what is it that we have at our disposal, again, that will enable us to deliver this type of intervention as part of our clinical practice? Additionally, if we look at people, so within most practice settings, we could probably all identify motivators or leaders in thought or change thinking, where they would encourage you to affect change and promote you within your clinical practice to do so. It may be that this person is a member of management, or it may be that it's a colleague who feels strongly that your skills are necessary within the wider service context. Who are these people and how can they potentially be of benefit? This then brings us on to the stakeholder identification and analysis. As you can see, we've looked at using the HSE Change Guide Stakeholder Mapping Analysis, template 6.1.2, to assist with this. The HSC Change Guide indicates a number of things to consider when mapping and analysing stakeholder involvement. At this particular point, we are more focused on the personal slash team interests and readiness, the level of interdependency and assist and influence the change headings. The HSE Change Guide gives a template for mapping these stakeholders and the accountability for the change and engagement and communication sections may form part of your implementation plan as part of the design stage of the process. By identifying key stakeholders and analysing how they may be of benefit to your new service initiative, you may be able to garner support from your local service in both peers and management levels who will help you and promote the service changes that you are suggesting. When we work with our clients, we never do so in isolation. And when designing a service change initiative, this is also useful to bear in mind. This brings us to the end of our define section of this presentation. We're now going to move on to the design section. In this section of our presentation, we're going to look at how we can use the design thinking process to assist us to establish and design changes within our service. The term design thinking was coined in 2008 by Tim Brown and was initially intended to be used within the business world. The purpose of design thinking at that point was to assist businesses to innovate and find creative solutions to problems that, they, that were occurring as their businesses and the world around them evolved. Within our context in healthcare settings, we can look at how each of these stages will assist us with providing creative, innovative solutions that will address any issues that we may encounter while implementing change within our services. So typically, it's a six-stage process where you would look at empathize, then define, ideate, prototype, test, and assess. As therapists working together within a healthcare context, I think we can all agree that this process mimics something that we may be quite familiar with. If we look at the, the reason behind a referral, it's to gather information about a problem or an issue that has been identified. The purpose of assessment is to increase understanding of the issue or problem. Goal setting identifies and agrees potential solutions. Intervention involves implementing or trialing these solutions. And evaluation encourages to ask the question, is this working? If we map this onto the design thinking process, while not an exact fit, I think we will find that some of the stages of the design thinking process have quite a lot in common 
with the therapy process with which we are so familiar. So why is this helpful? As busy clinicians, implementing new skills, new ideas and new areas of clinical practice in our work can be a significant source of stress. By looking at this from a process perspective, if we look at mapping it onto a process with which we are intimately familiar, we can see that we already have quite a significant skill set to assist us to achieve this process and to achieve it to a standard with which we are happy. The section of the design thinking process which tends to gain the most attention is the ideate stage. Ironically, this tends to be the section that most people instinctively skip towards. Human beings love a challenge and when a problem is presented, our innate instinct is to try and solve it or to come up with a solution that will enable us to put the the problem to rest. However, by neglecting the stages of identifying the problem or the question and trying to increase our understanding of what this actually means, we miss out on valuable information which potentially could inform the solutions that we generate. An invaluable tool when designing a solution for your service plan is Edward de Bono's Six Thinking Hats. This technique is based on the idea that each colour hat is representative of a different type of thought or a different way of conceptualising a problem or an issue. If we think about each of the properties of the six hats, the white hat looks at the facts. What do we know for certain? The red hat looks at our feelings, hunches, intuition, and sometimes making decisions. The blue hat emphasizes control and is more process focused than the other hats. The green hat looks at creativity, identifying possibilities, alternatives, and brand new ideas. The yellow hat aims to provide an optimistic voice. It's also known as the the ray of sunshine when trying to ideate. The black hat is the negative hat, which focuses on challenges, roadblocks and problems. There are many published sequences of how to use these hats and in what order. We will look at this a little bit further along under the evaluate your service section of this course. For now, just bear in mind that one of the main features of these hats is that they can be used in a variety of different orders with the aim of being able to address as many issues as possible and additionally providing the person who uses them with the flexibility to increase or decrease the input of any of the hats at any particular time. One of the main benefits of using this type of tool when designing solutions or potential solutions for your service is that you have the flexibility to innovate and create solutions which will fit to your specific service. This can be something which is quite daunting for many people. So by having a process and by having guidelines within which to work, we're ironically looking at putting a constraint around the creativity with the aim of directing it towards a solution with which you and your service will find helpful. A final note on using this technique. At the very start, you may find that there's almost a flood of ideas. We would encourage you to let the ideas flow. They do not have to be realistic. They do not have to necessarily work for your specific service. But if you capture them, you can discount them at a later point. However, if you start analysing solutions as you're going, what you'll find is the volume of solutions that you will generate will be much lower. With the aim of finding the needle in the haystack or the piece of gold buried deep beneath the earth, we would encourage you to list and identify as many solutions as possible without judgment. This has been shown to be the most effective way to get the most out of this particular tool. This brings us to the end of the design stage of this presentation. We are now going to move on to deliver. So obviously the purpose of looking at the divine and design stages are to get us to this part of the change process, which is deliver. As you can see, the information that we gathered in the define and design stages 
are both quite significant. So you'll be relieved to hear that what you'll be doing in this particular stage of the process is significantly more focused. If we return to the stages discussed within the design thinking process and how we mapped the therapeutic process onto a rough approximation of what it would equate to, you can see that Deliver focuses on the intervention slash evaluation or the prototype test and assess sections of both processes. Essentially, we're trialing the solutions, capturing information and then looking at whether it's effective or not. For the first time since we started this presentation, we're going to split Deliver into two particular sections. The first will be focusing on client services and the second will be focusing on service delivery. If this is a new area of clinical practice for you, or if this is an area that you are currently developing, both sides need to be delivered in order to have a cohesive package of care, which conforms both to service standards while also giving the client a service that will work for them. If we focus first on client services, so this is obviously providing, developing and reasoning out client focused strategies. The clear steps here from a therapeutic perspective are for the clients to trial intervention strategies and to develop their self advocacy skills when it comes to their sensory processing. From a clinician point of view, this is supported through the use of the crisis support tool, which Becky has presented to you and through identification of a communication strategy. When we discuss communication strategy in this context, we mean it very much in terms of with the client as well as the team. How does the client know what you want them to do and why you want them to do it? And additionally, how has this been explained and communicated effectively to staff? So when we're looking at developing client services, it's not just the therapeutic intervention we need to think of. We also need to think of the communication strategy, which will support its implementation. Additionally, the next step of this is to gather information through outcome measurement. How you will do this will be very dependent on the service in which you're working in and what resources you have access to. Please feel free to bring any questions, queries or ideas to the mental health special interest group sessions as we feel developing a network to support practitioners is essential, particularly with this area of practice. Following on from this, from a client services perspective, if we consider the concepts of evaluation and assessment, essentially we're asking the question, is what we're doing working for the client? Are we achieving our goals? From a client perspective, it is important to monitor a record of their implementation of the strategies, including looking at the frequency of use, as well as the level of impact that it had for them. Again, this may be formed as part of your communication strategy, whereby yourself and the client look at devising a way of capturing this data, both to inform clinical practice going forward and to act as a form of outcome measurement towards the end of your intervention. Following on from this, from a client services perspective, if we consider the concepts of evaluation and assessment, essentially we're asking the question, is what we're doing working for the client? Are we achieving our goals? From a client perspective, it is important to monitor a record of their implementation of the strategies, including looking at the frequency of use, as well as the level of impact that it had for them. Again, this may be formed as part of your communication strategy, whereby yourself and the client look at devising a way of capturing this data, both to inform clinical practice going forward and to act as a form of outcome measurement towards the end of your intervention. From a clinician perspective, this will allow for evaluation of goal achievement and it will act as a form of communication with both the client and the relevant stakeholders. As we all know, outcome measurement is an excellent way to de demonstrate the strides in which services are achieving going forward. No, that was really bad. From here, we will move towards discussing service delivery as part of the overall process. When considering service delivery as part of the deliver section, 
It is essential to remember that what you are going to start with is negotiating a beginning. Who are you going to work with? What are you going to do? Where are you going to do it? How will the work be completed? When will you find the time? And more often than not, you will be asked the question, why are you doing this? These six questions are misleadingly simple. The complexity of the information that you can provide to the relevant stakeholders, both your peers, line management and colleagues, by answering these six questions would be enough to answer most questions that you will be asked. We would encourage you when establishing a service to look at what you need to negotiate first, prioritizing where you want to start and having a focused but tiered implementation plan will allow you to establish a service which is based on evidence as well as clinical achievement. When considering service delivery as part of the deliver section, it is essential to remember that what you are going to start with is negotiating a beginning. Who are you going to work with? What are you going to do? Where are you going to do it? How will the work be completed? When will you find the time? And more often than not, you will be asked the question, why are you doing this? These six questions are misleadingly simple. The complexity of the information that you can provide to the relevant stakeholders, both your peers, line management and colleagues by answering these six questions would be enough to answer most questions that you will be asked. We would encourage you when establishing a service to look at what you need to negotiate first, prioritizing where you want to start and having a focused but tiered implementation plan will allow you to establish a service which is based on evidence as well as clinical achievement. On a final note, we would like you to consider the vast volume of information and the sources from which you can obtain it. We have listed a number of these on screen. By following the Define Design Deliver process, we would hope that you would have the tools to successfully implement new strategies and new interventions within your clinical setting. From an SIE perspective, we would like to offer ongoing support through the Association of Sensory Integration Practitioners. This is a membership-based service which also provides access to our SIE Mental Health Special Interest Group. The purpose of this group is to build a community with all of you where we peer network and problem solve together. We would advise you to look on the Sensory Integration Education website for all updated information regarding our upcoming events. Thank you for attending this session. We hope it has provided you with practical tools to get started with planning your service.